uh, the DevCSI blog. But um, Jody, if you'd like to come up, we're just going to take some pictures with everybody. Um, if we could just take a quick picture next to that. <laughs> and I'd just like to just thank everybody for all their hard work. And um, I'm really glad we had some entries. <laughs> So it gives, me, it gives me a great deal of pleasure to introduce uh, our final speaker of the day, uh, who is Professor Gary Hall from the University of Coventry. Um, a little bit about Gary. Uh, Gary is Professor of Media and Performing Arts in the School of Art and Design at Coventry. He's the author of Culture in Bits, published by Continuum, and digitized this book, The Politics of New Media, or Why We Need Open Access Now, published by Minnesota University Press. Uh, Gary is co-editor of two further books, uh, founding co-editor of the Open Access Journal Culture Machine, co-founder of the Open Humanities Press, and co-editor of OHP's Culture Machine Liquid Books series. Uh, Gary is currently developing a series of political institutional interventions using digital media to actualize or creatively perform critical and cultural theory, and also preparing two monographs, uh, Media Gifts, which is a follow-up to digitize this book, and On the Limits of Openness, the Digital Humanities and the Computational Turn to Data-Driven Scholarship. So I'm very pleased, as I say, to invite Gary now to give the closing address to this year's event. First mistake, I've forgotten my drink. Okay. So I've got two mics. You can hear from both of them or from one of them. Okay, so I'd like to begin by thanking a few people. I'm going to make this quick because I've been told we haven't got a huge amount of time left. So uh, this was going to be much more effusive, as you can imagine. But uh, Stuart and Martin and Florence for inviting me and looking after me while I've been here. And just to everybody generally because I've really enjoyed the conference. It, uh, it has a real fringe feel and uh, you should take that as a compliment. Okay, so uh, somebody earlier said that we need to change the culture around open access. And I guess that's part of what uh, I'm involved in with specific, specific reference to the arts and humanities. Uh, at the same time, I'm, I'm a bit worried that I might be, uh, you know, some of your worst nightmare. Some people here might find me their worst nightmare because uh, I'm kind of what happens when uh, arts and humanities researchers uh, get involved in open access open access, so you know, you've, got to, you've got to be careful what you wish for sometimes. Okay, so in March of this year, the Institute of Contemporary Arts in London hosted an event called Radical Publishing. And it featured a lot of talk from speakers such as B4 and Peter Harwood and Mark Fisher of K-Punk fame about politics understood according to the most conventional signposts most of which had to do with the production of political transformation elsewhere, the past, or in the future, or in the time Egypt. But surprisingly, given the, the event's title, very little about anything that would actually affect the work, business, role, and practices of the speakers themselves. So there was no discussion of radical ideas of publishing, of authorship, copyright, intellectual property, and so on. As a result, the event in the end seemed to be more about a few publishers, including Verso, Pluto, Zero Books, who may publish supposedly radical content, but who in fact run quite, according to quite conventional business models. And the event seemed to be about them promoting their authors and their products and providing us with more stuff to buy. They had a nice table outside where you could, you could invest in all of these things. So the content of their publications might be radical, However, their publishing model certainly isn't. And there's some of these issues that I want to talk about today with you. And I'm going to do so by focusing on a series of media projects that kind of operate at the intersections of art and cultural theory and new media. And I'm tentatively calling these media gifts. Oh, are we okay? And currently this series contains ten such gifts. And they include a digital book, two open access, uh, no, uh, two digital book series, an open access press, 
and a model for a radically new kind of online university. My starting point for thinking about these projects is the emphasis in all of them on the free circulation of knowledge and research, something that in one guise, as we know, has gained the moniker Open Access. So the Culture Machine Journal I co-edit has been open access from its inception in 1999. In 2006, we launched a Culture Machine repository, C-Search. Then in 2008, together with colleagues uh, from Europe, the US and Australia, I launched an open access press, Open Humanities Press. Now, there are a number of reasons that have been put forward as to why academics in particular should make their work available on an open access basis. And uh, one of the things that, uh, when Stuart invited me, one of the things he said is, uh, what I want you to do at the end is to sum up the conference, you know, sum up the two days. Uh, in the co okay, so here's my, here's my attempt to try and do that. So if I had to say, if I had to sum things up, then I'd say a lot of our emphasis at this conference has been on making repositories more use, usable, how we can increase deposits in them and user engagement with them, how they can achieve faster and more efficient delivery of well, more articles, how we can make them larger by linking all the data and by including uh, in them other well-known institutions, how we can use social media and even mobile media, media to showcase researchers, publicise repositories and bring deposits to attention, make them discoverable with a view to increasing traffic, hits, impact, REF, etc., provide added value. That's my summing it up in a sentence or two, my attempt anyway. It doesn't get anything and I apologise to anybody's work and ideas I've missed. And that's all really, really important. Of course it is. However, we shouldn't lose sight of some of the political and moral reasons behind open access. And these include, well, the argument, the taxpayer's argument that we shouldn't have to pay twice for the same research, once, once for publicly funded academics to carry it out, and then again to access it in the form of journal subscriptions, book cover prices, and so on. The moral argument that our commitment to the value of research carries with it a responsibility to circulate to all those who are interested in it, including those in less affluent parts of the world, rather than restricting access merely to those who can afford it as we do now. And the belief that doing so helps create a healthy democracy by breaking down barriers between academia and the rest of society, and so supplying the public with the information they need to actively contribute to political debate. Open access is the same by some as enabling the production of a global information commons and renewed public sphere, of the kind associated with Jürgen Habermas and, as we heard yesterday, the BBC. Now, most people would probably, uh, no, most people associated with open access would probably see open access as being political in at least one of these terms or something similar to them. And I do think these are important to bear in mind, as I say. However, what I do in my work, what I've been investigating, I've been arguing that the way open access is most interestingly political is not in any of these senses. For me, open access is most interestingly political to the extent it has the potential to create an undecidable terrain in which a decision nevertheless has to be taken. And this definition of the, the political as a decision taken in an undecidable terrain is one I'd say I'd share with the political philosophers Ernesto Leclerc and Chantal Mouffe. Except that for Leclerc and Mouffe, the political is always hegemonic. And whereas for me, the decision regarding hegemony has to be taken in an undecidable terrain too. And this distinction is important, and it's why I'd say my philosophy is political and, and theirs is anti-political. And I'm going to explain this. 
So, uh, there's going to be about five minutes of political philosophy. Anyone who doesn't like that? <laughs> it's like the Pantana, but he's the science bit. He's the political philosophy. Anyone who doesn't like this, go on tweet, go on Facebook, go on. Your, I'll give you a shout when it's over, okay? And we'll get to the project. Okay, so here we go. So the first thing to say is that, contrary to the way it's often perceived, the political is not always hegemonic. Hegemony is a particular form of the political. And what's more, I'd maintain this is the case with respect to both senses in which the concept of hegemony is usually understood. The sense in which it refers to the leadership or dominance of one class over another, but also the sense of hegemony as a generalised political logic. The Clow and Mouffe understand hegemony very much as a generalised political logic, so I'm just going to explain now what that means. What this means is, from this perspective, a society can institute itself only by virtue of its relation to that which exists outside and in excess of it. So the chav, the hoodie, the immigrant, the religious, religious extremist, and so on. Now what this means is a consequence is a society can never achieve absolute unity and st stability as its identity is constitutively marked by this non-closure. So you can never get this unified community. You've always got kind of this non-closure, this difference in it. And it's within this context that uh, the context of this instability, that hegemony operates. And hegemony consists of the attempt to provide social relations with a temporary degree of closure, stability and meaning by way of an act of articulation of this social. And this is how a we, us, which can exist only by the demarcation of a they, them, is established and maintained by means of an articulation which determines who this we is. And this is why every social order is hegemonic for, in nature for the Clarence move, even a communist one, even us here. Because power relations are constitutive of the social. And it's also why the political is a decision taken in an undecidable terrain. Because such social relations and not the result of objective, scientific, economic, or historical processes. They're the product of contingent, pragmatic, yet temporary decisions involving power, conflict, and violence. That's the downside. The upside of that is it has the advantage that these articulations can be disarticulated and transformed as a result of struggle between agnostic or conflicting adversaries, and a new form of hegemony established. So we can see that any political decision necessarily involves a relation to hegemony for Leclerc and Mouffe. For me, however, any such decision regarding hegemony, that has to be taken in an undecidable terrain too. I mean, if we're going to follow them and say the political really is a decision taken in an undecidable terrain then surely it must involve remaining open to the possibility of bringing even ideas of hegemony into question. Which is not to say, before you leap in, that I think we're now living in a post-political or post-hegemonic world, such as Slavoj Zizek or Ulrich Beck. They've both claimed that. I'm not ma maintaining that a responsible decision can't ever be taken to the effect that we should use hegemony as a concept to, to use when we're attempting to analyse a particular situation. Nor that we should never attempt to, uh, to, co to create a chain of equivalence among political struggles, as Leclerc and Mouffe put it. For example, between all those who are struggling against the policies of the current Conservative-led government in England. After all, we may not want to hegemonise, but this doesn't mean capital won't do that for us anyway. In fact, if we don't realise it's doing this and work against it with some form of counter-hegemony, isn't it all, more, all the more likely that it will? So in an era of Facebook and YouTube and Twitter, hasn't becoming minor, as the Deleuzians put it, become the kind of default option now rather than a positive choice? There's recent events in Egypt and Tunisia illustrate if different struggles, say in the UK, those of the trade unions, UK Uncut, Take VAT, 
the student protest against increased tuition fees, if they're not to remain forever marginal and minority, don't they sometimes need to join up with each other, at least to, enough to establish some chains of equivalence between them? Otherwise, how are we ever going to create anything that's lasting, any new forms of institution, culture, community, such as we've been talking about? So I'm not rejecting Leclerc and Mouffe. I'm not rejecting theories of hegemony. I'm just drawing attention to the fact that Leclerc and Mouffe had a transcendentalized and fetishized notion of hegemonic politics, which, even in their own terms, is not political, since they themselves don't appear to be willing to make an actual political decision about any of this not one that's taken in an undecidable terrain and remains open to the possibility of making a decision in favour of struggles which don't require hegemonic articulation. Now, why I'm going through all this is what we can see is that what it means to be political now is not something that can be decided in advance, once and for all. Rather, the political has to be invented and created in relation to specific practices, in specific situations and contexts, by taking decisions in an undecidable terrain. So it's not already decided what the political thing to do is. And it's with opportunities for doing this, for making affirmative, inactive interventions, by using new media to create singular situations in which people are encouraged to take such responsible political and ethical decisions that I've been experimenting in recent years with a number of others. And I'd see the, the Culture Machine Open Access Repository that we launched in 2006, see such as one instance of this. To put this briefly and in some context, let's take the example provided by the publishers Taylor and Francis in Forma. Their list features over 80 media and cultural studies journals, among them some of the most highly respected in the field, including Routledge's cultural studies. Yet many cultural studies scholars would be surprised to learn one of Informa's subsidiaries was recently working for the US Army to assess how well it achieved its goal of battlefield digitization. And the US Air Force, meanwhile, used the same subsidiary to help improve it's management systems for U2 spy planes. So in this context, we saw the Sea Search repository as a way of intervening at that time in the material conditions and institutional practices of the academic publishing industries. That's what it kind of looks like, or did. It did so by providing a radically different, free, independent, open access way for those in cultural studies to publish and disseminate their research. It also helped to bring open access onto the cultural studies agenda and draw attention to the political economy of cultural studies publishing and to convey the message that what gets published and therefore gets to count as cultural studies is not the result of fixed and objective processes, peer review or whatever. It's a product of contingent, pragmatic decisions Involving power, money, conflict, and violence, quite literally, in Informer's case. We also saw this repository as helping to show that the articulations of the academic publishing industries can be disarticulated and transformed, and perhaps even new forms of hegemony established, whether it be open access or some other publishing model based on peer-to-peer -peer file sharing or whatever. And this is how open access at the moment is most interestingly political for me. Because it's capable of positioning academics in an undecidable terrain. Making it that little bit more difficult for them to avoid taking responsible political decisions regarding their own material and political institutional practices. Particularly about how and where they publish and that's and this who they give their labour to, Taylor and Francis, or an open access journal or repository. In the process, it helps us, enables us to experiment with different kinds of institution, 
in a terrain, that of digital culture, that is not closed down and decided in advance, or at least not yet. That's why I'd argue that what I'm doing with these Media Gifts projects, even when I'm explicitly writing about open access, is trying to think beyond open access. Not to leave open access behind and replace it with something else, but to follow the logic of the open access movement's philosophy through to the end, without reserve, to the point of agreeing with it against itself, as it were. So John Wilinski, for example, has positioned open access is both a critical and practical step toward the unconditional university imagined by Jack Derrida. However, I'd maintain that the open access movement is actually rather conditional. It's not unconditional, it's quite conditional. It may promote the right to speak and resist unconditionally everything that concerns the restriction of access to knowledge, research and thought but it does so for the most part only on condition that the right to say everything about a whole host of other questions is not exercised. And that includes the kind of questions about the intellectual, the writer, the author, and the work that I'm trying to raise with many of these projects. And the latter can perhaps be seen most clearly from another of these media gifts. Okay, that's the philosophy, so you can come back to us now, those that have shifted over onto Twitter. Okay, so Liquid Theory TV here is a collaboration with Claire Birchall and Pete Woodbridge. And the idea is to develop a series of IPTV programs. IPTV standing for Internet Protocol Television, if you didn't, weren't aware of that. And the reason we wanted to experiment with this is because Britain at the moment contains surprisingly few spaces for uh, open to the creation and dissemination of what for shorthand might be referred to as innovative, energising, kind of left intellectual ideas. Mainstream media are predominantly liberal, humanist, middle-brow and journalistic. Sorry if there's anybody in there from the room. Uh, their discussions of art, science and culture being primarily opinion-based and focused on biographical details. Meanwhile, many academic publishers are barely producing books for third-year undergraduate students let alone research monographs aimed at other scholars. So this seemed to be, seems to be a need to invent new, flexible, fluid ways of producing and communicating such intellectual ideas, both inside and outside of the university. We want to explore IPT, IPTV's potential for this, and for doing so relatively easily and cheaply, in a manner that's fairly easy for others to replicate in their own singular ways not out of desire to reveal with these programmes some otherwise denied or hidden or manipulated truth about society, nor because we believe academics should try to find means of connecting with audiences outside the institution, audiences that scholarly books and journals somehow cannot reach. Although the medium of IPTV does enable us to connect with a far more heterogeneous and geographically distributed audience than is ordinarily possible with academic books and journals, we're not interested in becoming public intellectuals or media personalities. If we're not trying to build our brand and we're not trying to be Brian Cox, I'm sure he's a very nice man. Which is why after, the, the first, after this first episode, we kind of quickly moved away from being presenter-focused to experiment with more non-individualistic mode of presentation. If we have time at the end, I'll, I'll show you a clip. I mean, that's also because we're completely, incredibly camera shy and we just hated doing this. Uh, so, you know, there's a theoretical justification and there's a personal one as well. So we're far more interested in bringing the accepted, taken-for-granted ideas of the intellectual, the writer, the author, even the work into question making an intervention in the academic field by creating new areas of expression and, and generating new knowledges and techniques and experiences and expectations and trying to create a new way of being in the world for us as academics, something which I think many of you here can, can help with. And that's something that Claire and I are also trying to do with the New Cultural, new cultural Studies, the Liquid Theory Reader, 
which is a project we used this first episode of Liquid Theory TV to introduce. Uh, okay, so the idea for the Liquid Theory Reader, bye-bye, uh, uh, came about in response to a publisher asking Claire and I to produce a follow-up to our 2006 edit collection that we brought out with Edinburgh University Press called New Cultural Studies. And what this other publisher wanted, it wasn't Edinburgh, what was, they wanted a reader which gathered together important texts by some of the theorists and philosophers that were discussed in the 2006 volume. So Agamben, Badger, Deleuze, Cook, Kittler, all the trendy people. It seemed to us, however, that to turn the idea of any new cultural studies into a fixed brand like this would be miss the point of what we were trying to achieve with that book. So being kind of awkward and career suicidal, we decided to put together what we're calling a liquid book instead. And what we did is we gathered together some texts by some of the theorists discussed in the first volume, together with some by those we'd want to include if we were to produce a second. So people like Lazzarato and Hales and Nancy. Instead of publishing this as another print-on-paper book, however, we've published it online. We wanted to experiment with publishing a book in this way for a number of reasons. For one thing, it allows us to challenge the physical and conceptual limitations of the traditional codex book by including more than just book chapters and journal articles. We've been able to include whole books in our liquid book. Not just that, but short extracts from books, as well as pages, snippets, references, quotations, even podcasts and YouTube clips. Publishing a book in this way has also allowed us to explore some of the possibilities of the general movement toward publishing academic work online. What with open access, open scholarship, Google Book Search, Scribed, and the development of handheld book readers such as Amazon's Kindle and Sony's Reader. But the main reason we wanted to experiment with publishing a book like this is because we could make it not just open access, but open editing and writing too. So our book is liquid, not just in that it's free for anyone anywhere to read, it's also open on a read-write basis for users to help compose, edit, annotate, translate and remix. And by pro producing it in an open, collaborative, decentralised fashion like this, we wanted this liquid book to raise and encourage others to raise challenging questions. Can we produce academic scholarship and critical cultural theory in this way? What does it do to our ideas of the author, publication, of content creation, quality control, even the book itself? So we're moving in the opposite direction, if you like, the emphasis on author claiming that we heard about at the beginning of this conference. And we're endeavouring to raise similar questions with one of our latest projects, which is Living Books About Life, which is edit, edited by myself and Claire and Joanna Zielinska. And this is very kindly funded by JISC, and what we're doing with this project is developing a series of 20 co-curated open access books about life with life understood both philosophically and biologically, which provide something of a bridge between the humanities and the sciences. So the Liverpool Project's collaboratively, collaboratively produced books are repackaging and representing existing open access science-related research content from repositories such as Cogprints and PubMed Central by clustering around selected topics whose unifying theme is life. So, for example, air, agriculture, bioethics, extinction, neurology, pharmacology, and so on. And again, an important feature of this project is that these books about life are themselves living, if you like, in the sense they're open to, being on, to ongoing collaborative processes of editing, updating, and commentary by readers of all levels. So as well as clustering and repackaging the available open access science material on life into a series of 20 books, the, book, the project is also trying to rethink the book itself as a living, collaborative endeavour 
in the age of open access and open science and open data. Okay, and I realise it's been a long two days and, you know, the time's getting on and you're all just thinking there, yeah, yeah, all this talk about books being authored and edited in a decentralised fashion like this is something of an avant-garde fantasy on our part. Yet there's already been a dramatic decentralisation of authorship. One set of figures claims that from the year 1400 onwards, book authorship increased by nearly tenfold each century. Today, however, authorship, including books and new media, is growing nearly tenfold each year. That's from a century to a year. By the same, talk, uh, by the same token, a publication as mainstream as the New York Times here has already experimented with decentralised editing in the form of a personalisation platform called My Times that allows you to select headlines from almost any New York Times section many external sources as well, and then rearrange them on the page any way you like. This particular experiment led the software and audiovisual performance artist Amy Alexander to speculate on the long-term possible effects of such open, decentralised editing, on the importance and value of famous publications such as the New York Times. Now, for Alexander here, such a scenario would indeed lead to a dramatic downsizing of the New York Times' authority and status. To be featured in the Times is still seen by many as an anointment of importance, she writes. But would that same level of importance be perceived if a New York Times story resembles a cross between an Associated Press wire story and an RSS feed? My question in turn is, could what Alexander predicts for the authority of the New York Times also have implications for that of academic stars such as Agamben, Latour, Zizek, whoever you want to mention? Indeed, for academic authors in general. Is one of the possible long-term effects of such decentralised and distributed editing going to be a shift in power and authority here too? Not just from the monograph to the collection or reader, but from the academic author to the academic editor or compiler. And with that, will the importance and value of the famous academic publisher of known quality be similarly downsized to the point where publishing with Harvard or Oxford University Press or in journals such as Nature or Diacritics becomes no more a sign of importance than appearing in the New York Times does in Alexander's account? Or is there potential for change even more profound than that? It's interesting that the shift in authority for Alexander is only from author to editor, blogger to compiler. For me, this is, sim this is simply to replace one source of authority, the author, with another in the form of the editor and compiler. In which case, it doesn't really bring the authority of the author into question at all. It merely transfers that authority to a different location. Far more interesting is the potential liquid and living texts have to raise questions for those alternative sources of power and authority too. So we passively rely on either the author nor the editor, the blogger nor the compiler to provide texts with authority and validity. Rather, we have to take more rigorous and responsible decisions regarding texts, their importance, value, and quality. Not least because the actors that perform these roles, as either, as either authors or editors, are often no longer clearly identifiable, or even always human in the era of Google News. Instead, both the author and the editor functions are decentered and distributed across a multiplicity of often anonymous actors with often unknown qualifications and credentials. Even more profoundly still, it's not just the identity of the author and the editor that such decentralised and distributed editing has the potential to bring into question. It's that of the work itself. For one thing, both the livable and the earlier Culture Machine Liquid book series, of which the Liquid Theory Reader is only the first volume, one thing they could be said to be doing 
It's decentering the author and editor functions, making everyone potential authors and editors. In this respect, both of these series can be positioned as addressing an issue raised by Hurt Loving. Why are wikis not utilised more to create, develop and change theory and theoretical concepts? Instead of theory continuing to be considered the terrain of the sole author who contemplates the world, preferably offline, surrounded by a pile of books, a fountain pen and a, note and a notebook. Yet, in his essay, What is an Author?, Michel Foucault warns that any attempt to avoid using the concept of the author to close and fix the meaning of the text risks leading to a limit and unity being posed in a different way by the concept of the work. So we may have raised questions for conventional notions of the author by making our liquid and living books available under open editing and uh, open writing conditions. But to what extent does the ability of users to rewrite, remix and reversion these books render untenable any attempt to impose a limit and unity on them as works? And what are the political, ethical and social consequences of such liquidity for ideas that depend on the concept of the work for their effectivity? Those concerning individualised attribution, citation, copyright, academic success, promotion, and so on. We wanted to use wikis for raising such questions because, as the example of Wikipedia illustrates, the network distributed structure of wikis means anyone, anywhere, can potentially join in, publish, and participate in projects like the Livable and Liquid Book series. Indeed, there are currently over 130 people involved in the latter project from Brazil, South Africa, Hong Kong, the Lebanon, Europe, Europe, the US and Australia. These books just have the capacity to be extremely pluralistic. We can even enact a multi-locational, multipolar, multimedium, multiple identity series of books, if we wish. And this last point is especially important with regard to the centre-periphery model of the geopolitics of knowledge. In this model, there are just a few nations at the centre of the global academic and publishing networks who are exporting and, in effect, universalising and globalising their knowledge. And interestingly enough, this is the case even with the most radical of theoretical or philosophical works, works which in their content explicitly try to undermine such centre-periphery models. So let's go back and take those of Michel Foucault. Foucault writes and publishes his books of philosophy in Paris in the 1960s and 1970s. They're picked up by the US and UK academic publishing networks, translated into English, and his theories of power, governmentality, biopolitics, care of the self and so forth, are then exported around the world. Meanwhile, there are a whole host of other nations outside of the centre of the global academic and publishing networks who, while they may be able to import universalised knowledge don't have enough opportunities to publish, export or even develop their own universal knowledge to rival that of Foucault or Badiou or Latour or Ronciere or whoever's trendy at the moment. Now there are various reasons for this. Their language may be a minority one. People working in these countries often don't have the kind of access to the amount and quality of research literature this taken for granted by those closer to the centre of the global knowledge networks, which need to be cited and referenced for research to be accepted by international journals and publishers and their peer reviewers. Nor do they have the kind of local academic or publishing networks that can help them get read and cited and so produce, develop, support and disseminate their work in the first place. At most... These scholars may get to export empirical data, which provides local detail that can be then used to flesh out the universal knowledge of those who are closer to the centre of the geopolitical knowledge networks. Now, the wiki medium can be of assistance when it comes to avoiding the reproduction of this state of affairs, it seems to us. 
not by enabling us to try and attempt to speak a common language. We're not trying to produce some global, academic, open access commons or kind of linked and united repository or database in that kind of sense. Nor does this medium enable us to play more, place more emphasis on the so-called periphery, say by privileging contributions from outside the centre. There'd be risk in that of repeating and maintaining the kind of centre, periphery, self-other relations I've already raised questions for. It can mean assistance by making it possible to produce a pluralistic academic and publishing network. One with a far more complex, fluid, antagonistic, distributed and decentered structure with a variety of singular and plural human and non-human actants and agents. Okay, nearly finished. One final project I'm going to mention. This was influenced by film and video art and specifically the peer-to-peer -peer art of Anders Weberg. It's called Pirate Philosophy. And this investigates some of the implications of so-called internet piracy for the humanities. And it explores such ideas philosophically, but it explores them legally too, through the creation of an actual pirate text. So what's happening is I published Pirate Philosophy version 1 as the opening essay to the 10th anniversary edition of the Culture Machine Journal. However, it was available there for a limited period only. After a couple of months, I placed it on a pirate P2P network and deleted the original from the Culture Machine site. As soon as someone downloaded the P2P version, I destroyed my original file. So there's now no longer an original or master copy of this text in the conventional sense. Instead, it only exists to the extent it's part of a pirate peer-to-peer -peer network and is pirated. So all copies of this text are now pirate copies. And again, the aim is to experiment with issues of authorship and publication and accreditation and copyright and intellectual property and so on. How do you know I haven't already done something like this with this lecture? And what if I have? What if I've already placed a version of the text of this talk on a peer-to-peer -peer network and made it available for anyone not only to read, download, copy and share without charge, but also to remix and reformat and reversion? What if I have destroyed the original version of this lecture so that the only version I can present to you here and now is a pirated version that's been authored and edited and circulated distributively. How does that affect your ideas of the author, of scholarly writing and publishing? <laughs>